with your mind set on a goal I am the dreamer who will follow her soul You need the traffic lights to know which way to go I trust in my heart and in the way the wind blows But somehow magnetic attraction had led to despair Again. Welcome, everybody. This is Richard Sachs. It's nice to be with you again. This is our show for a worldwide broadcast on Sunday, the 8th day of April nine, uh, 2000. No, it's the next millennium now. I have to keep remembering. 2018. And um, tonight we have a uh, special guest from the UK coming to us from there. And it's uh, our friend Ian Crane, who one of our listeners introduced me to Ian a little while ago, to, to his website anyway, and then I got to meet him in person over Skype. And Ian has been an oil field executive out, out in the field working for some big companies. We'll talk to him about that. And then he got interested in um, what else was going on in the world from other perspectives and ended up being all uh, wrapped up in learning about New World Order, Agenda 21, uh, a lot of things that are being done to destroy both society and the uh, biosphere that we depend on for our support here on the physical level. And um, he's got a really interesting conference that's coming up that we'll talk about. It's, I think, in about a month from now. And um, way more to talk about than we have time for right now. But So we'll, we'll get into some of the more immediate stuff and um, use the time as well as we can. So welcome in and thank you for being with us it should be fun to talk about these things hi richard and i appreciate the invitation um okay what what i'd like to do to introduce you to people that may not be familiar with your work already is uh, as we often do with, with guests in situations like this is go back to before you got involved in your current activities at least back to where you were working for the big oil companies or before, if you want, tell us, you know, how you developed your interest to where it is now and what led up to the present activities. And then we'll talk about what you're doing um, right now. OK, well, uh, basically, I didn't work for the oil companies. I worked in the oil field services industry. OK. Uh, of which there are two main players. There's a few smaller players, but there are two major players. One is Halliburton, with whom everybody right. heard about. Yeah. Uh, primarily, obviously, because of um, the Dick Cheney connection. Yeah. Um, but I worked with Schlumberger or Sch uh, Schlumberger, as it's more commonly known in the U.S. Okay. Um, but uh, Schlumberger uh, was the, the largest oil field services company on the planet. Um, and it very much liked to nurture the um, the case of nobody having ever heard of the company because that kept it away from any scrutiny, right. and and so consequently not being an American company it was uh, actually French Canadian registered in the Dutch Antilles, mm -hmm. uh, but it meant that it could operate anywhere where basically um, uh, sanctions were being applied and where our competitors couldn't work. Mm, okay, uh, I had a you know um, I worked primarily in. Um, human resources and in uh, health, safety and environment. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, an engineer by original qualification, um, I actually uh, was in a training and recruiting and subsequently an HR role. Um, when I left Schlumberger, I left as, uh, in 1998 um, and I was uh, HR director for a Dowell Schlumberger in North America. So that meant I had responsibility for everything from the Rio Grande up to the North Slope of Alaska. Mm, okay. um, but prior to moving to the U.S., um, I had a couple of other assignments, uh, one in Paris, um, in, uh, in France. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was in the Middle East. And in fact, I was HR director 
um, for, or back then we called it personnel still, uh, mm -hmm. human resources is, is a very deliberate construct uh, so that, um, you know, the uh, employees know exactly what they are. They're a commodity. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. Yeah. But it's, back, not back, just, it's not just a cute PR term. It has meaning to it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, of course, that's why, you know, we, I mean, it's venturing off a bit here, but, I mean, that's why, you know, we now have what is colloquially known as the gig economy um, so that the corporations can literally use, abuse, and discard their human resources at whim. Um, you know, so I did have the good fortune to work in the industry when there was a degree or a, certainly a greater degree of, um, a, dare I say, sort of mutual loyalty. You know, the recognition that uh, if you looked after key employees, then, you know, they tended to give you uh, fairly loyal service, mm -hmm. um, especially when the rewards were quite high. So, uh, but when I was in the Middle East, I was uh, HR director, personnel director for Dow El uh in the Middle East, which gave me responsibility for everything from Egypt in the uh, southwest to right through to Iran in the uh, in the northeast. And uh, so I was in the Middle East when uh, war was effectively declared on Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went out there uh, actually immediately after the invasion of um um or sorry, kuwait. Of the invasion of kuwait yeah in 91 mm, right and you've done I a have, tremendous I, amount of traveling in all this i guess right? i have i have i have done i've certainly uh traveled a fair bit um yeah i was just trying to think of the date and of course it was i think it was august the 2nd or thereabouts in 91 uh, 1990 when um uh saddam was of course baited into invading kuwait by right the then U.S. ambassador to uh, uh, to Iraq, April Glaspie, who effectively was instructed to tell Saddam that America wouldn't get involved in an, and I quote, Arab-Arab conflict. Right. So we had the, uh, the period between um, August 1990 and I think it was January 15th, 91, uh, you know, where there was the Desert Shield operation. Uh, but that went live in January of 91 and of course we had the bombardment of this um, was the beginning of the shock and awe demonstration of how uh, under bush the u.s could blow up anybody they wanted to right? uh, absolutely and um so i i remained in dubai uh, for the duration be, uh, between mid-january and uh, third week of march and, and at the end of hostilities i was one of the first uh, civilians to go into kuwait uh, and I went in with um, um, representatives of Halliburton and also the four firefighting companies that were contracted to deal with the fires that had been reportedly set alight by the retreating Iraqi forces. But while we were driving around the, uh, the oil fields, it became pretty apparent to me that uh, that was not the case and that um, actually... You know, the evidence suggested that the wells had been set alight by uh, special forces mm -hmm. from the U.S. and the U.K. primarily. Part of a larger strategy, in other words. Absolutely. And I mean, the strategy, I mean, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the strategy was to take Iraqi oil off of the global market because um, Saddam was seen as a bit of a loose cannon. And, you know, he could he could tank the oil price to uh, uh, reap the uh, market opportunities that that would create. Mm -hmm. And uh, so rather than, um, you know, him upsetting OPEC and upsetting, you know, the global uh, petrodollar uh, construct, then they took him or wanted to take him off the, of the market. So, of course, the U.S. and the U.K. were both um, ha trying to get the support to actually invade Iraq at that time. But the, the Arab countries basically reminded the U.S. that that wasn't the agreement. The agreement was to get Saddam and Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. And, and so there was no, um, no motivation by the Arab uh, coalition to support any uh, American invasion of, uh, of Iraq. And, of course, that's what occurred. <coughs> Excuse me. And sanctions were put on Iraq for the next uh, 12 years or so. Mm -hmm. But um, having seen what I saw, 
um, I actually made comment to the American lieutenant who was escorting us as we were doing a study as to you know what resources would be required to deal with the fires and uh, you know he was clearly embarrassed by my observation and um, less than 24 hours later I was having lunch in the in the mess at uh, the headquarters of the Kuwaiti oil company in Akamadi and uh, this guy in battle fatigues 300 pound gorilla with no, no markings on his battle fatigues, but he, he clearly knew who I was. He stormed up to me and he said, uh, you are Ian Crane? And I didn't answer, but he said, you know, I've been hearing you've been casting some aspersion about who set them wells alight. <laughs> and I, I still didn't say anything. And he said, boy, he said, that's the kind of thinking that can get you into a whole lot of trouble. And you best be keeping your mouth shut. And, and you know, I was just sort of rocked by this. Excuse me. <laughs> and, um, um, anyway, at uh, that time, you you didn't suspect at at that particular period uh, what was actually going on, right? On uh, well, no, 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 I hadn't. I mean, this this was, I mean, I was aware of uh, you know geopolitical machinations. I mean, I was aware of what had been going on uh, to fuel the Iran Iraq war between eighty two and eighty eight, but this was the first time that I'd had you know up close and personal exposure uh, to right. something that you know, really was, you know, a major stage play uh, to achieve a particular geopolitical agenda. So while I'm telling the story fairly glibly right now, um, you know, what is it, 20, uh, 27 years after the event, mm -hmm. at, the time, at the time, I was absolutely crapping myself. I mean, yeah, you know, my concern was that, um, uh, that I wouldn't make it back to Dubai, that I might just, uh, you know, have an unfortunate accident somewhere along the way. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is a, quite a reasonable concern. I'm sure that happens all the time. Well, yeah, I'm sure it does. But um, on this occasion, I did get back to Dubai, obviously. Um, and then a few days later, I had a call from um, uh, a very senior executive within Schlumberger. And it was very clear to me that the administration in the forces in um in kuwait had sort of fed word back up the line that you know this guy in crane had sort of conned on to what's occurring you know can we trust him and uh, so you know it was very clear in the phone call that i had that uh, uh, there wasn't a you know the guy wanted to establish that uh, you know i i could deal with it and that i uh, i wasn't going to uh, have a breakdown over it right well you know, what could I do with it? Back then we had no internet, you know, we barely had mobile phone networks in um, in the major towns and certainly not global connectivity. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I just basically sat on it. Um, and in fact, I didn't go public with it until I think it was about 2003 where I, I uh, mentioned this in a, in a, a similar um, discussion. And uh, within 24 hours, I was contacted by the American, uh, the Veterans Association. And um, it was an email that uh, had been passed to them, which they had corroborated the authenticity of. And uh, basically, um, it was somebody who confirmed that they were a member of the special forces teams that set the wells alight mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. uh, 1991. Um, so, you know, you know, clearly my observation was vindicated by that uh, communication. And, you know, subsequently, I mean, Tariq Aziz, who was the Iraqi foreign minister at the time, and he was a very, very well-respected statesman, uh, not least because he was Christian in, obviously, what was uh, a Muslim uh, government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he made the observation, you know, in an interview, subsequent interview, and he said, you know, what benefit? would we, Iraq, have got from setting the wells alight? Now, you know, he's a statesman. He wasn't going to turn around and say, we didn't do it, Gov. Yeah, um, they, they wanted the American public to think that they were being set afire by the, the people that owned them because they were losing them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was really, um, anyway, the event of 91. And, you know, it took me seven years, really, to integrate that experience. And... Um, then, as they subsequently, I took assignments in Paris, France, which was very enjoyable. Um, and then I was based in Houston, Texas, between 
July 95 and when I finally left Schlumberger in uh, mid 1998 and um, uh, you know by and by that time I mean I'd, I'd reached the age of 40 while I was in the US mm-hmm. and you know I whilst working in the US was very interesting and um, uh, I enjoyed my time in the US but I also obviously got to see the dark underbelly of US society Mm-hmm. And and that coupled with my collective experiences in the global arena, uh, I decided that it was time to step outside of the the corporate arena. And you know, at the time, I had no idea what I was going to do, uh, but I just knew it was time to to step away from the corporatocracy. Um, and, and that I was did, like back around two thousand or something, or a little 98, after ninety eight. Ninety eight. Okay. And then I actually I took a year out, you know, I, I took a year out. I stayed in the US. I took a year out. And you know what? I played golf. I played golf every day. Um, and um, one of the things I discovered was that I was absolutely useless at golf. You didn't uh, become you didn't become an expert at golf then. Absolutely not. Which is probably just as well, because otherwise I might have You'd suffered, still be doing it. Yeah. Well, delusions of competence or something, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but no, it was it was it was a great way to sort of make the break. Although I must confess, I did get lured back into the corporate world um, briefly for about 18 months. Um, I took an assignment in Amsterdam mm-hmm. uh, and working with a company that you may have heard of called Lucent Technologies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which was, of course, um, back in the, uh, the turn of the century, it was the most widely held stock in the United States. Uh, because the stock price had climbed so dramatically between the spin-off from AT&T in 97. Mm-hmm. Well, coming in from the outside, I could see the scam that it was. And it didn't take me too long to start talking about, you know, the fact that it was a scam. Yeah. And that uh, it was heading for a massive collapse. Uh, which So I, I joined them in July 99. And, of course, we had the dot-com collapse in... Um, about February, March of 2000. Right. Uh, and, it, you know, for me, coming in from the outside and not having any skin in the game, as it were, it was as clear as a bell to me that uh, that was going to happen. So anyway, I walked away uh, from uh, Lucent Technologies um, in, uh, I think, about September of, of 2000. And uh, that was basically my last salary check. That was my last connection with the, the corporate world mm-hmm. and then from that point forward that's when i really started my process of completely re-educating myself i mean i started from the basis of everything i thought i knew was probably wrong so let's start at ground zero right okay and so you found well, out that, that that was true then i mean your guess was right yeah and um uh, you know, obviously, I already had a uh, you know a good basis on which to start, but um, I really threw myself into uh, into the research. And by mid two thousand and one, uh, and of course, I wasn't the only one, but I, I was actually in Belize at the time, and 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 I was I spent some time in Central America because I was taking the opportunity to research and study uh, Mayan mythology. But one of the things that became very clear to me in um, uh, in mid by mid 2000 was that George W. Bush was was sitting on the bench uh, and waiting for something of great significance to occur to launch him onto the world stage. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I didn't know what that was going to be, but it was becoming increasingly obvious that that was exactly what was occurring. Right. And then I was actually in in Belize in on September uh, the 11th, 2001. It was it was um, eight o'clock in the morning for me in Belize, just after eight o'clock when everything was going down. Mm-hmm. And um, when the when the second tower collapsed, I, I jumped up from where I was watching it and I said, this is it. This is the event that I've been talking about. Now, I didn't know what had occurred on that day, of course. All I knew was that this was the event that had been effectively created to change the whole dynamic of global politics and i came back to the uk the following weekend and i spent the next seven months drilling down into everything i could find on the events of 9 11 and even to this day i probably have one of the most significant um 
repositories of video and um and and photographs from the day because i was collecting them you know just as soon as i could find them mm-hmm. and, and it took me until april of 2002 uh, and even to this day i wouldn't i wouldn't claim that i know what happened but like you know millions of others around the world i certainly know what didn't happen yeah um and and that uh, of course really set me off and i I, you know, I thought, okay, well, fine. I have had the luxury of being a full-time researcher on this topic. Obviously, the vast majority of people don't have that luxury. So in 2003, early in January 2003, uh, I started um, a, a series of presentations around the UK trying to stimulate people's curiosity to look at the evidence of uh, 9-11 and then look at the narrative and you you know once you actually started to spell out for people how the physical evidence in the public domain not only didn't support the official narrative it actually undermined the narrative and and yet of course the vast majority of people were swallowing the narrative without any further investigation yeah, if it was on TV and all these top commentators were agreeing on it, it must be true. Exactly, exactly. So um, I, I did that, and in fact, I was the founding chairman of the UK 9-11 Truth Movement. Um, but um, by 2005, of course, we had the London bombings, which were also very much a construct. And uh, unfortunately... There were enough people in the UK who had um, done their own research into the events of 9-11. And, and so, you know, they, they knew the templates. They knew what signs to look for. And uh, sure enough, if, I mean, these guys who perpetrate these events, they're not particularly creative. Um, and it seems that they're somewhat limited in the sort of templates that they have. Well, they, um, they really haven't had to be because the public's gone along with it anyway. Well, sadly, exactly. And, you know, once again, um, when you look at the physical evidence of what occurred on July uh, 7th, 2005, um, you know, you very quickly realize that actually the physical evidence doesn't support the official version of events. And in fact, you know, flags up uh, questions that the establishment continues to refuse to answer. But, you know, whilst there are some people who get bogged down, I mean, we've still got people who are obsessed with with 9-11. And and that's good, you know, because it keeps it in focus. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, then uh, those of us, you know, who perhaps are still trying to find the ways in which we can stimulate the curiosity of the wider population. And, you know, here we are today, nearly 17 years after the events of 9-11. And, you know, for most people, it, it's distant history. And, I mean, certainly anybody under it's, the age of 25... It's so know, strange, because to me, it seems like about 10 minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. You know, and I say, yeah, but the people under the age of 25, mm-hmm. um, you yeah. know, really have... Well, it, it's not in their, in their past memory. Right, okay. So, you know, it, for them, it's like the Second World War was to me, you know, when I was um, was that age. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's something that occurred before you really had any uh, any um, consciousness of, uh, of events. Right. So, you know, as I say, the good news is that, you know, we have the 9-11 Truth movement. We have architects and engineers for, for 9-11 Truth. And, you know, it's great that there are people who are keeping the discussion alive. And the same with the London bombings. You know, it's great that we've got people who are keeping the discussion alive. And, of yeah, course, what yeah. the establishment has tried to do is you know, it's created a whole bunch of other events um, subsequent to that to dilute the focus right. on 9-11 and the, uh, and the London bombings. And I, I think that there's some similar situation with the Kennedy assassination, too, right? Even though that was a little bit earlier. Absolutely. Of course. Although the papers on that, the documents were just released a few months ago, and um, it was blacked out on the media, so the public wasn't really told about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, that was 63. So, uh, you know, I, I think I was, I was seven at mm-hmm. the time. And, right. um, you know, and, and that's probably, 
it's probably the first time that I can recall my parents being sort of visibly shocked at something that they saw on the on the black and white grainy television that we had in the corner of the front room. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then five years later, when I was 12, uh, well, I think I was actually 11 at the time, but, you know, uh, for five years later, nearly when Bobby Kennedy was um, assassinated, you mm -hmm. know, I have absolute very clear recollection of where I was, who I was with, um, and, um, you know, and obviously the, the events sort of subsequent to that. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, that we've we've had those events, um, you know, of sixty three and sixty eight, but um, they weren't necessarily defining events in terms of a global awakening. Okay, right. No, I I agree. I mean, everybody knew that it was just lone crazy people that did those things, and there was no connection yeah. to anything. Exactly, uh, because you know, at the time, I think most people still. Um, well, they didn't have access to anything beyond the official narrative. Right. Yeah, we had uh, um, three so, stations on the television. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and the national newspapers, and that was it. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, that, the advent of the interconnectedness provided by uh, the Internet mm -hmm. has changed the whole dynamic. And, you know, were, was it not for the Internet, then there's no question that, uh, you know, the, the level of awareness would not be what it is today. And indeed, of course, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Right, right. No, there'd be no way to talk to each other. And, and all you'd no. have is the newspaper story every morning. Exactly. You know, um, and everybody just sort of fits into uh, their role in society. But, uh, you know, with the advent of the Internet, and even in 2001, of course, the, the Internet was really only about five or six years old. Mm -hmm. um, so it was still, you know, a relatively new tool. Not everybody had access. I was very fortunate that um, at the time, I mean, we still only had modem access. We didn't have we didn't have the uh, anything like the speed of, that we have today. Yeah. But uh, the fact that, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't burdened with uh, phone networks and the like. So, um, you know, for me, it was still relatively fast at the time. But, you know, here we are now in 2018. And, of course, we have other problems coming our way, which I'm, we perhaps will touch on with things like 5G. But, um, you know, the, the connectedness, the access to information, even with the establishment desperately trying to bury a lot of important information. Nonetheless, you know, the, the, those of us who have now got a, a couple of decades almost of research experience, you know, we know where to look. We know where to dig. We, we know the, the deep, dark recesses of the archives of the Internet. And uh, so, you know, consequently, because we have that experience, then, you know, when we're talking on particular issues and we're trying to stimulate people's curiosity, we can pull up supporting documentation that most people have no idea that even existed. And, and of course, much of that documentation comes, uh, you know, from government think tanks um, or, uh, or academia. And where in a lot of cases it was written purely for other academics. But now that information, you know, is extremely pertinent and uh, it, it's very much time to bring it into the public domain. Yeah, I completely agree. So did you gradually get the idea of what part you wanted to play in, in doing that? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say I've ever actually had a plan. Um, <laughs> what, in fact, quite the opposite. What I, what I did do was, in fact, in fact, I stopped having plans. In fact, I stopped having um uh, a particular desire to achieve any particular outcome um you know what i decided that i wanted to do was to simply try to stimulate people's curiosity because you know the one thing that i have never claimed is that i have the definitive version of anything okay. um and so it, all i have been trying to do really since 2003 when i first started my public talks on on 9-11 um, all I have tried to do is motivate people to step beyond orthodoxy, to step beyond the propaganda mediums of the establishment, 
And, uh, you know, whilst obviously, yeah, it's good to know what the establishment's pumping out, because that way when you're talking to people who still rely on that information for their information, um, then you know what the start point is. But if you can actually stimulate people's curiosity to go beyond that and start exploring the alternative media um, and, and just tapping into multiple sources and encouraging them to rediscover their ability for discretion and discernment and to come to their own determination of what might or might not have occurred. Yeah, so you're, you're really educating people in a way that the schools should be if they weren't all, you know, fake and going in the wrong direction. You're teaching people to observe and to look at what they're observing and notice patterns and come up with the reasons that those patterns might be there and that sort of thing. Exactly. And, and I mean, it's, um, I mean, forgive the term, but it, it's trying to achieve epistemological integrity. You know, epistemology is the, the theory of knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and sadly, of course, the vast majority of what people consider to be their knowledge is, is actually the establishment construct. So they're mistaking learning, well, they're confusing learning with memorizing. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, what, what, and of course it, it's tough for people. You know, it's really, really difficult for people to accept that they've had the wool pulled over their eyes they, they've been hoodwinked for you know their entire lives um, by an establishment that simply wants to keep them dumbed down and effect in, in effective economic slavery well it kind of shakes their whole vision of reality when they start looking at that right yeah exactly you know and I mean nobody likes to come to the realization that they've been taken for a sucker yeah. Um, you know, and, and they'll defend they'll defend the fact that they've had that view, even even when it's staring in them in the face. That well, they have, well, because if they have to accept that, what else might be not true? Well, hopefully that's the first stage of them coming to the realization, like I did, that quite possibly everything you thought you knew <laughs> yeah. is a complete I, crock of crap. Yeah, I, I think that, as I've said frequently, I think the conspiracy theory people are completely wrong because it's way worse than what they imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Much, much deeper, you know. Much, much, much deeper. And, you know, and the thing is that um, uh, it's not for me to um, suggest what I think occurred. That's not, that's not relevant, you know, um, because once somebody puts out a definitive then you're actually limiting the opportunity to absorb new data, new information that might. Well, that's that's exactly what the thinking. what the establishment does all the time, right? Of course, absolutely. It wants it's to effectively build boundaries around the construct that it's creating, so that people will not step beyond those boundaries. And of course, that's why you know Ayn Rand and um, Alan Green and Greenspan, you know, back in the back in the 60s when they were part of this uh, inner uh, think tank you know they came up with the term conspiracy theory conspiracy theorist to dismiss and to demonize anybody who dared to challenge the orthodox version of the kennedy assassination exactly and they found that it was a very useful phrase to keep going exactly and and you know what i mean in fact ironically i used it uh, this morning in uh, in my morning broadcast because uh, I made the observation that I said look you know when when people throw out the term conspiracy theory what they're really saying is they haven't done the research and whatever it is that you're suggesting people might want to look at is actually outside the boundaries of their comfort zone and in some cases it's even beyond the bounds of their capacity for perception at that particular juncture mm -hmm. and so the they go on the defensive and the, the way they go on the defensive is to label something as a conspiracy theory or a person who's putting forward a hypothesis as a conspiracy theorist and and they do so in the comfort that there will be thousands and maybe millions of others who will also throw out exactly the same label but just yeah. because just because it's a minority that have the alternative view 
doesn't make it wrong. And and what is, of course, building is the number of people who are seeing through the construct is growing exponentially. And that's this is why, I mean, it's a big new Brzezinski, uh, I think it was back in 2009, Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he gave two speeches, actually, uh, very similar speeches uh, in a very short time span. Um, I think one was at the UN and the second one was at um, in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Yeah. But the commonality in the two speeches was that he made the observation, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. And then a few weeks later in Davos, he he added a comment. He basically made the same observation. He said, you know, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political and spiritual awakening of the masses. Hmm. Now, of course, I mean, he didn't expand upon it. And, you know, there's no record of any Q&A session. But nonetheless, you know, for the likes of Brzezinski and of course, let's, you know, we look at Brzezinski's track record, you know, from right from writing between two ages, the Technotronic era in 69, which is what got him into the attention of the Rockefellers when they put him on the payroll. Um, but, you know, Brzezinski has, has been at the heart of the uh, left of centre um, think tanks since the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. Isn't, you know, it, isn't it interesting that, that he would have made a comment that the spiritual awakening of humanity is a major problem that has to be dealt with? Yes. I mean, what it it makes regular people wonder what would you have to be thinking about saying something like that? Everybody well, else thinks it's a good thing. Well, you know, I think we got to go back and look at the observations that he was making when uh, he wrote Between Two Ages and you know, I I think Between Two Ages, the Technotronic Era is a book that I would absolutely encourage people to to read. Now, um, let's put it into context. I don't think it was an original work in some respects. What he was doing, he'd take another doc- another document and effectively updated it or embraced it and and incorporated it into his um, his thesis. And the document that I'm referring to as original source is a document called Technocracy Inc., which was written by. Uh, Marion King Hubbard and um, Howard um, Scott in 1932 and uh, Howard Scott was the senior of the two and uh, Marion King Hubbard his junior partner but th- this was effectively a visionary document looking at how technology could be used to control humanity now you got to bear in mind this was written in 1932 now so back then they had the vision but they didn't have the technology now, I actually believe. That I, I, I just want to intru- introduce one idea there without you losing your train of thought, and that's are you familiar with the book uh, by Patrick Wood called Technocracy Rising? Absolutely, of course. Right. And, and, yeah, he's been on the show a few times, and he, he refers back to exactly the history that you're talking about. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's clearly, you know, out there. It's a good train to follow because we go from Technocracy Inc. And then, of course, we you know if we go to 1948, right. we have uh, Eric Blair writing um, um, 1984. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, other people know him as George Orwell. Okay, um, right. So he wrote 1984. Now I don't believe for one minute that uh, 1984 was written as a work of, of absolute fiction. Eric Blair wrote two seminal books in the latter years of his life. The first, of course, was Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. And Animal Farm, in my opinion, was written as a warning against a left-wing, i.e. communist, totalitarian regime. And then a few years later, in 1948, he wrote 1984, and I believe he wrote that as a warning against a right-wing totalitarian regime. And, of course, Technocracy Inc. Um, actually is probably more right than, than left. But uh, nonetheless, it is about establishing a totalitarian technocratic regime. Right. And, and, and in, a, in a way, the 
right and left is a minor point of style, right? Because both of them are tyranny and control. Absolutely. Without any shadow of doubt. Um, and so we roll the clock forward a little more, in fact, nearly 20 years, to um, the 1960s, or the early 1960s, because then we have the document that manifested in 67, I believe, called the Report from Iron Mountain. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that some have tried to dismiss that as a forgery, whatever that might mean, but the reality is that it was remarkably prescient. And whether or not Zbigniew Brzezinski was part of the think tank that produced the report from Iron Mountain, or whether once it came into the public domain, he simply latched onto it, because between two ages, the technotronic era is, is effectively a, um, a composite of Technocracy Inc. and the report from Iron Mountain. But one of the observations that uh, Brzezinski makes in um, techno uh, in um, between two ages is and I'm I'm I can't remember the exact quote but basically he re he suggests that in the future government will be led by a technocratic elite who will not be constrained by traditional liberal values now it's a very very interesting observation because basically what he's saying is that once the technocratic control grid is in place then there's no need for traditional libertarian values well yeah when he said traditional <clears throat> liberal values he meant real liberal values like freedom exactly exactly right and so here he was actually effectively advocating that this is how things would un would uh, evolve and, um, you know, so even in you know, 1970, when the book was released, it was effectively um, a, a template or a blueprint for everything we see unfolding right now. Right. And this was before most of the technology was developed anywhere near where it became later. Absolutely. I mean, you know, 1970, um, well, you know, shit, we didn't have computers. I mean, I think it was about 1970 that I actually got my first calculator. And, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it was a very basic calculator. And then I think, I think by about 1974, I'd upgraded to a scientific calculator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we are... We are the scientific decade. ones were the ones that could do geometry and stuff like that, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You, had, you had log, uh, log capacities, etc. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and so we have 10 years still before any kind of computing. I mean, I think the first time I had a computer on my desk was about, ironically, about 1984. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and then, of course, you know, the rest, as they say, is uh, is history. And, and then we have the Internet from about 1995, 96. I mean, we had an intranet in Schlumberger, which I was using from about 1990, 91. Mm -hmm. um, but then the intranet evolved into the internet, as a, um, uh, with Netscape and the likes, and that was probably about 95, I'm guessing. So, around, uh, somewhere around 90 or 91 started the first public Windows exposure too, right? Yeah, um, I think uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think Windows was very much experimental in in 1990, yeah. um, and was pretty much commonplace within probably three four years. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, we we we're into we're twenty. I mean, not even twenty five years of um, computing as we know it today. And and look at look at how fast, you know that that technology has um, has uh, developed. Yeah, um, isn't isn't it amazing that 1984 was so far in the future, and now we're way beyond there. Yeah, still alive, amazingly. Yeah, and um, and of course, you know the the technology that uh, we've all embraced, you know, provides the establishment with all the tools they need to uh, monitor and track. Now, as uh, I'm sure, you know, your some of your listeners will be aware, you know, we've recently had the 
scandal of uh, Cambridge Analytica and the, the data mining that um, uh, they were undertaking. But, you know, nobody should really be surprised that this is occurring. I mean, I work on the basis I don't put anything into the Internet that I don't want to be in the public domain. So consequently, exactly. I yeah. never post anything about my personal life on the Internet. Yeah. Yeah. Never. Yeah. You know, but sadly, you know, we, we, uh, we've got a, a generation of people that's coming through that has no concept of privacy. Right, right. And, and, you know, this is going to be taken advantage of. Yeah, if you're a, not a major criminal and you have nothing to hide, then what are you worried about, right? Yeah, that, that's the attitude. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, they're being sort of sucked into this um, open arena. Um, and, and I think, actually, uh, um, you know, Hollywood, obviously, play. I don't know if you've ever had Jay Dyer on your program, but um, oh. he's one of one of my speakers at the uh, forthcoming AB9 conference. And, you know, he, he speaks about esoteric Hollywood and how, you know, Hollywood effectively is part of the programming mechanism to, you know, put into the mass consciousness what's coming. Yeah. And, um, and, and actually sometimes, of course, it's used in the, uh, in the converse to try and raise awareness of what's coming to try and stimulate people to uh, resist it. It's and complex because, yeah, the, the powers that are in charge also have certain esoteric requirements. If they're going to destroy us, they have to give notices at each stage. And well, they, have, they have to, exactly right, they have to tell us what it is they're planning to do, and then it has to be we who do it to ourselves. Yeah, that, yeah that's the ideal situation, right. Yeah, so, you know, consequently, it's never them who... Fight well, they have to help us though uh, sometimes because yeah. we're a little slow to pick up our script and things. yeah they can they can speed things up but ultimately it is not them doing it they right. they provide the tools for us to do it to ourselves right yeah they're just the benevolent you know overseers that are trying to enlighten everybody exactly uh, <laughs> so you know th this is why the awakening process you know this uh political and spiritual awakening that Brzezinski refers to nearly a decade ago mm -hmm. is, is such a problem for them because you know once once we have that level of awareness then you know we can choose either to continue to participate in their construct or not I mean today you know I elect not to participate in their construct I mean I live off-grid mm -hmm. I live on the front line of, um, of, of activism, particularly now as we're trying to uh, prevent the abomination of unconventional gas exploitation, i.e. fracking, mm -hmm. uh, to prevent that manifesting in the, in the UK. And unfortunately, of course, in the US, you, you have areas of the country that are effectively uninhabitable due to this process. Oh, so you know, I, I choose to still continue to do what I do in terms of raising the generic awareness but then I, you know, I came to the realization about uh, f a little over five years ago that, you know, it's one thing to talk about it. But, um, you know, whilst obviously I can't address and could never even begin to think of, uh, you know, addressing every issue. Um, so I picked one and it just so happens that it jumped out at me because I was in Australia uh, back in the back end of 2012. Uh, on a lecture tour speaking about the Australian economy but I took the opportunity to go into the gas fields of southern Queensland and and what I saw there I mean I wasn't totally shocked because it was what I expected to some extent but nonetheless it really rammed the hard reality of what the unconventional gas industry does in terms of destruction of ecology and the, and the negative impacts on um, on health yeah, I think it would, be, it would be really worthwhile for you to describe that in some detail for people so they feel like they've been able to go and see what you saw in Queensland. Okay, then I'll come back to the detail in a second. But, you know, so when I, when I um, witnessed that uh, and I was actually making the observation, you know, I said, this is, this is horrendous. Thank goodness we've got a moratorium in place. A moratorium is a temporary ban 
thank goodness we've got a moratorium in place in the UK. Well, a week after I got back to the UK, the moratorium was lifted. Wow. Uh, and, and I decided that, uh, okay, you know, th this was something I really had to get very much involved in and, and do everything I possibly could to help ensure that um, this abomination doesn't manifest in and the... the the moratorium was against fracking, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with fracking. Um, you know, over a million wells have been drilled and fracked in the U.S. Um, there's not too many states where uh, they haven't. New York has a ban on, on fracking, um, as does, I believe, Maine. Okay, but, well, uh, well, just for the people that don't know, since you're talking about it, why don't you explain what fracking means? Okay, well, fracking is the process of abstraction of unconventional hydrocarbons. So, conventional hydrocarbons are extracted by uh, drilling a well and dropping the well into the target geology, which uh, is highly porous and has a high permeability rate. And so consequently, when you open the well, when you perforate the well in uh, at the target geology, then the hydrocarbon, be it oil or gas, will free flow into the well and come to the surface. So when you say perforate, you mean make holes in the casing? Yes, exactly. Okay, so listen, just for people that have no idea what you're talking about, the casing is a tube that goes down in the hole that you drill that holds the hole open. But it's a solid tube, and so when you make holes in it, then whatever's outside of it can flow into it, right? Exactly. Okay. And, and, you know, obviously the purpose of the casing, and the casing is cemented in place, and the purpose mm -hmm. of the casing is to prevent, in the ideal situation, to prevent any contamination of the hydrocarbons at any of the other geological strata. Yeah, so as the, de as the deep um, strata of oil is being pulled up, it doesn't stop on the way and contaminate the groundwater. That's the idea, exactly. Okay. And, and generally, I mean, obviously there have been problems, there's no question about that, but you know, generally it's a, it's a relatively mature and um, a relatively uh, safe industry. That's conventional hydro. So, so they have to cement it down deep enough so that the cement goes below the water tables, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my I, mean, I mean, down below the aquifers that they're passing. Absolutely, through. yep. Okay, yep. all right. So, but unconventional hydrocarbons is a very different process. Um, when you're targeting unconventional geology, it's also known as which is a good explanation, a good uh, description, because when you drill down and you open the well to that tight geology, there's no natural flow. Right. So, it's, it's as if there's no oil there. Exactly. It's like it's like you got into a dry it, hole. It, it's trapped in the rock. So to release it from the rock, you have to pump down millions of gallons of water. You have to use fresh water. You cannot use. Uh, brackish or saline water it has to be fresh okay. and you mix it with a cocktail of extremely toxic chemicals and you pump it under enormous pressure into the target geology and that then fractures the geology so it opens up the geology and so it's almost like you're exploding the rock down there right that's exactly right okay so what you're doing is you're creating artificial permeability and porosity in the geology to bring the hydrocarbons to the bottom of the well and then ultimately obviously to the surface okay 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 so when why do you have to use the toxic chemicals what's the function of that to effectively to um break open to fracture the 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 geology i mean there's a, the the guy who invented the process was a guy called george mitchell who worked with halliburton and he invented the process actually back in 1947 Hmm. But he, not not for um, not for unconventional geology, he was he was looking to use this process to increase the flow rate in um, uh, conventional geology. But you know, once the well was starting to uh, lose pressure, then he was looking to find a way to open up the geology to recreate that uh, lost pressure. So the toxic chemicals are, are super corrosive and they kind of semi-dissolve the rock, is that exactly. true? Exactly, 
Now, George Mitchell, the point I want to make about George Mitchell is that in the latter years, he died recently at sort of the ripe old age of 90 something. Okay. But in his latter years, he stated and he said, had he ever realized that this process would become corrupted in the way it has, because he only ever envisaged that you would use water and sand. He uh, never envisaged that the toxic chemical mix would be added to the process. And he realized that he'd actually opened up um a real can of worms you know by by this um by inventing this process wow but that's really so he was only talking about using pressure not poison yeah and, and of course what happens is you know today the geologists work with the chemists you know they work with the petroleum engineers and, and they literally have no holds barred it's whatever toxicity whatever is necessary to maximize the flow rate from the target geology. And Sounds so what, just like uh, modern medicine and agriculture. Well, exactly. Exactly. And so what you have today, um, unfortunately, is horrendous contamination. And, and this is caused by a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, the millions of gallons of frac fluid, the combination of the water, the sand, and the chemicals, uh -huh. Once when it's pumped into the geology, it's considered to be an exceptional frac job if 40% of that comes back to the surface. Wow. So where does uh, the other 60% go? That's a very, very good question. That are you saying the part that comes up to the surface gets somewhat cleaned up? No, it doesn't. It, I mean, basically, it, it, it's lost to the system. And in, in the U.S., in the U.S., you have three methods of disposing of this toxic waste that uh, comes from uh, back up from the um, the fracked well. Uh -huh. The first method is evaporation pits, and this is a, a pit that is um, dug alongside the uh, uh, the well site. Uh, it's lined with a membrane, and then all the fluid, the waste fluid, is pumped into this pit, and it's simply allowed to evaporate. And of course, that works extremely well in the southern states, uh, where you've got um, the warmer climates. The problem is, of course, that the toxicity is effectively evaporating into the the atmosphere and is then combining with, you know, the precipitation. And so you're getting you're getting toxic rainfall in a right. In a so you're you're contaminating the atmosphere, and then the residue, because I'm sure it doesn't evaporate a hundred percent. The residue would be some kind of a salt or something that goes into the ground somewhere. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be uh, the sludge will be disposed of at a, a toxic waste facility. Right, and just so because they call it a toxic waste facility doesn't mean you're not poisoning the environment there. Exactly. In fact, they are. Uh, it's just a designated location that um, you know where they bury the uh, the toxic waste. So that's one method of. Um, of disposal and what and, and in that one method what happens to what's left in the ground from the rest after 40 percent uh, no one knows <laughs> great nobody has any clue but it, it you know it, it's still doing what it was designed to do which is be aggressive in its destruction of the geology it just goes on doing that until it gets too diluted at some point. yeah and uh, in some cases of course it breaches the um uh, into the adjoining geological strata and if the adjoining strata is more porous, then it accelerates the flow rate by which those toxins can reach eventually into the water table. Right, into the aquifers. Okay. Yep. All right. So method two, you were getting Method two is using old depleted wells and pumping the waste down into those wells. And, and this is the process that has been used extensively in Oklahoma and in California. And it's why Oklahoma has become the earthquake capital of the United States. So if you look at the um, U.S. Geological Survey's uh, own data, prior to 2009, Oklahoma was considered to be extremely stable geologically. But it was in 2009 that the process of uh, frac waste disposal down existing wells um, but um, exhausted wells mm -hmm. was implemented. So here we are, not even a decade after that process was uh, um, initiated in Oklahoma. And today, Oklahoma has far more seismic activity 
than California. Wow. And I mean, everything I'm sharing is a matter of public record. And I really, I mean, just p- people just punch into their search engine, you know, Oklahoma uh, fracking earthquakes or Oklahoma earthquakes fracking, you know, anything like that. And you will see the plethora of information that, uh, you know, links it to it. So that's method two. Okay. But between those two methods, they still can't get rid of it. Actually, there's a fourth method. I'm going to, I'm going to, the next one I'm going to give you is they use the toxic waste for irrigating agricultural land. Oh, brilliant. And in wow. California, in particularly in Northern California, I mean, I've covered this on one of my fracking nightmare broadcasts. Um, in, and I identified the brands, the food brands that are being um, uh, openly sold in the stores in California where the crops are grown having been irrigated with frack waste. That must be just unbelievably toxic junk to put on crops. I wonder, Yeah, uh, I, it, that's a real testament to the uh, people in the legislature that they would think that that was a good idea. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's sociopathy in the extreme. Yeah. So even that, even between you know those three methods, it's still not enough. So, um, an incredible amount of waste is simply dumped, and much of it is dumped in the Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, it's estimated that some 75 billion gallons of frac waste is dumped into the Gulf of Mexico annually. So, you know, what, we, what we've got going on here, and of course this is just one aspect of, of um, you know, the contamination of our ecology, but uh, you can see why it is that, you know, the evidence is so compelling in the U.S. I mean, we haven't even touched on the um, impacts on livestock and on human health, mm-hmm. which are now becoming increasingly well documented. And, and yet in the U.K., where this industry hasn't yet become established, you know, the, the government and the industry tries to literally ignore all of that evidence and tell people but that's okay you know it's completely safe here because we have gold standard regulation and i can categorically assure everyone you see that everybody in the u.s heard exactly the same um yeah i mean gold standard regulations that's so impressive that you don't even really have to think about it right (laughs) that's what they try i mean it's it's classic um uh nlp and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and, you know, in Australia, I mean, the process of fracking unconventional uh, hydrocarbons in the U.S. is probably closer to two decades. Um, in back, the late 90s was when it really kicked off. Yeah. In Australia, in southern Queensland, it only kicked off in 2006. And, you know, there's a lot less wells being drilled than in the U.S. I mean, it's a million wells in 20 years in the U.S., in, in Australia, it's about 20,000 wells in southern Queensland in an area the size of the UK. And, uh, you know, the water, like I said, it has to be fresh water. In the US, the gas companies have been sucking the water out of the Great Lakes and the Great River system, the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio rivers. And in the west of the country, they've been sucking it out of the deep underground aquifers. In Australia, they've been sucking the water out of the Great Artesian Basin at a rate six times greater than it can naturally replenish. Wow. And, 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 and an area in southern Queensland, the size of the UK, um, has effectively become so toxic that it cannot support any agriculture anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in the UK, I'm used the, you know, the, if you like, the skills that I've developed over the past 15 years or so to try to stimulate people's curiosity so that they look at the evidence of what's occurred in the US and in Australia and then decide for themselves whether or not that's something that they think is appropriate for the UK. Right. right. And in the UK, the the area that's being targeted is a very significant tranche of uh, northern England, literally from coast to coast across northern England. Mm-hmm. So because it's such a, a large area, 
then obviously we're having tremendous success in motivating communities to um, uh, rise up and, and resist the attempts by the gas companies to come and establish a presence in or close by to their communities. So here we are in the UK. It's now five and a quarter years since the moratorium was lifted in December of 2012. And we are still frack free. So Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, their legislatures have put bans on fracking. So we're just left with England now. Okay. And, um, you know, we still have a lot more work to do. But uh, nonetheless, you know, the fact that we haven't had any fracks in, in the UK for five years is uh, not insignificant. And, you know, it's, it's having the effect as well of politicizing people in the UK. I mean, unfortunately, um, really, during the Tony Blair government and, um, and his successor, Gordon Brown, you know, Britain had, had basically given up on politics. And, and You're talking about the general population, right? Yeah, the general population, yeah. And so it was really difficult to get people to engage. You know, they were, especially after the economic crash, you know, they were more focused on um, basic survival in some cases. Right, right. Um, so we've now had um, eight years of Tory government, of right-wing government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the effect actually has been very interesting because their policies have been so sociopathic that it has politicized the country like nothing before. And so, you know, out of adversity and all that, but we really are in a very interesting situation right now because um, we are seeing a level of interest and participation in UK, not politics directly, but in the, in, you know, in everything about UK life. Mm -hmm. that, um, uh, and the government is under more scrutiny than it's ever been under before. And obviously fracking means that the industry is under more scrutiny than ever before. And, and so, you know, there is a, a very, very significant benefit to all this. So how, you know, briefly, how, how do you think that you got the moratorium done in Northern England? And what does that mean for the rest of the world that would like to do something similar? Well, I don't think there's a template, um, but, you know, the, there's no magic formula. But the, the crucial element is to motivate communities. I mean, I'm not stopping this. There's no anyone, anyone, any individual who claims they're, they're doing it alone is, is totally delusional. You know, the only thing that brings about social change, real social change, is community engagement. Mm -hmm. and, 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 of course, politics and the media controlled by the politicians it is about doing everything you possibly can to minimize any kind of social engagement so what you want is you want your corporate slaves just to do what they do you know go to work um make their contribution to the corporatocracy come home you know enjoy time with the family um enjoy a bit of time at the weekends uh, and then back to work on monday and, and yeah. you're letting them know what's going on through your media outlets, Fox News. Yeah, let them watch as much television as possible. Exactly. As long as they don't really engage, you know, just, um, you know, keep them, keep them um, bemused. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really a question of getting people out of that. And, and of course, unfortunately, sometimes it has to be right up close and personal. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people who have been fighting fracking in the U.S., um, you know, some quite successfully. Like I said, New York has uh, um, managed to get a, a ban on fracking. They're not out of the woods, though, because a lot of their water supply comes from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which is being fracked to smithereens. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, and in the US, of course, because it's such a large landmass, and it's the same in Australia. So although in the northeast you have high population density, um, which is why, you know, you got the success in New York, perhaps. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you get out into the uh, into the deep south, you know, then you haven't got the population centers. So it's, it's really difficult to get people to engage. 
Right. In so it's it's like how do, how do you save places like Oklahoma, right? Yeah. Especially when, you know, a lot of people in Oklahoma, of course, have, have some connection or some family right. member They're who has Being supported by the oil industry. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, I mean, like I said, it's, it, I, I'm not going to suggest for one moment that there is any kind of template, you know, or, or formula that can be applied. The only common denominator is, can you get the community engaged? If the community don't engage, then the corporatocracy will simply just ride roughshod. And in fact, just earlier this evening, you know, I was having a conversation with um, uh, somebody um, from um, southern Queensland, and I was last out in Queensland in 2014. And in fact, I, I made a, a documentary um, of that visit, uh, and it's called Voices from the Gas Fields, because I wanted to put a documentary together to show people what was happening in the UK and what had happened in Australia. Is uh, there a way people can see that? Yeah. yeah, it's freely available online. It's on my YouTube channel. Just simply uh, punch in voices from the gas fields. Okay, got it. And, um, you know, my, my underlying message was, you know, if we don't listen to their story, it will become our story. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So where, where does the whole project stand right now? What are you mostly working on? Well, uh, um, obviously, you know, whilst I sense that uh, we're on a roll with um, the anti-fracking campaign, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we absolutely have to nail the the lid of the coffin shut, as it were. So, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to be overly optimistic, but I do sense that the British government is beginning to realise that this this has such traction that the strength of feeling around the country is so strong that it's a political hot potato, and that the smart thing to do would be to find a way to uh, to shut it down. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes it hard for the average person to understand the dynamic of this whole thing is that why would these people who are in power, supposedly representing the people, why would they not just realize this is a really bad idea? Why does it have to be that it's a political hot potato or something like Why Why can't it just be obviously a bad thing to do? Well... Because their mindset is not the same as you or I. Um, look, to, to whilst the majority of people who enter politics enter in with altruistic intent, I don't believe for one minute that the majority of people enter their first political role mm -hmm. with the intention of anything other than contributing to the greater good. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long for them to realize that, one, if they want to survive, they have to prostitute their personal values. Right. And then, unfortunately, it's not a big step beyond that, having prostituted your personal values, to actually realize that the more you prostitute your personal values, the more you can reap material gain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and from that point forward, you are effectively a sociopath. Yeah, it's it's just sounds very similar to what we heard on a, a video from a, I think it was a Danish banker or somewhere in Scandinavia, that said he was told when he was approaching the higher levels of power, that he was warned to put his conscience in the deep freeze, and uh, like a hundred below zero, not just part way. Yeah, and and that at that point, and then he was invited eventually to take part in ceremonies where they were killing kids and he he didn't get very far in that but the general idea was exactly what you just said is that you have a choice either get kicked out or fail at what you think you're doing with your career or get rid of these uh bothersome personal values and you'll be fine exactly and you know any anybody who's had any kind of longevity in politics has sold their soul and, you know, every now and again, they may be given the opportunity to do something that, uh, you know, they really feel strongly about and they feel right. And mm -hmm. that's perhaps what enables them to sleep at night. But for every one thing that they they really do <laughs> and it's appropriate for humanity, unfortunately, there's probably a hundred other things that they've either chosen to ignore or actually contributed to 
what is effectively an assault on humanity in one way, shape, or form. So I've all, always often wondered what happens if somebody knowing that enters the political world and gets elected and then decides to go public every day from when they first get in and tell exactly what kind of bribes and threats they get and what it's really like on the inside. I would suggest that they would soon develop some um, fatal disease. Sorry, I couldn't hear you, Ian. Say that. I think they, they, the likelihood is that they would probably fairly quickly develop some fatal disease. Yeah, yeah, or an accident or something. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, you know, um, one again, you know, we talked about um, occult rules. If you have taken the uh, the draft from their goblet, you know, if you have been initiated in any way into their rituals, into their ceremonies, if mm -hmm. you have taken any of the bribes, you know, in any way, shape or form, then basically they got you. Yeah, I'm saying what if you don't do that and you start exposing it from the first day that you get in? No, no, you, well, you're not going to survive. Yeah. They're, you're absolutely not going to survive. You know, the, they're either going to find a way to bounce you out of politics and mm -hmm. you'll, just, you'll just disappear into oblivion, you know, yeah. or um, you'll have an unfortunate accident. But my, yeah. my point is, so, you know, we're talking about this stuff and people often ask, you know, well, how come, how come you're not targeted in the same way? But, you know, there are some basic ground rules. We have never compromised our integrity. You know, we, we have never prostituted ourselves in, to the degree where they own us. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so consequently, I mean, I'm not being blasé about this, um, but neither am I paranoid. You know, it, it's imperative that we do what we believe to be right to do. And, you know, my attitude is that, you know, I've lived a full life. Um, and, um, you know, the first half was in the corporate world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that was very much part of my, my education. Oh yeah, and, definitely. Uh, much of what I do today, I couldn't do, or I couldn't do as effectively if it wasn't for that, um, 20 year apprenticeship in the corporate world. Yeah. Um, but today, Today, obviously, I, I use that knowledge and experience uh, for what I hope are very different ends. And, you know, perhaps it's a bit simplistic, but, you know, I, I think we can boil it down to whether an individual is, is motivated by, if you like, the greater well-being of humanity or is motivated by enhancing their own material wealth. Right. And I say that may be a simplistic divide, but, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, fortunately, there, there are an increasing number of people who are prepared to speak out, um, you know, particularly in, in the world of medicine. I mean, we know we've had a, a horrendous number of um, tragedies amongst uh, alternative health practitioners, particularly mm -hmm. those that have endeavoured to highlight the... Um, uh, the role of, of cannabis and cannabis oil in curing cancers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because obviously the uh, allopathic uh, medicines of Big Pharma uh, are a massive revenue stream. And, you know, Big Pharma wants to do everything it possibly can to maximize its, its revenue streams. Well, and one of the most dangerous things to talk about has been vaccines also. And vaccines, exactly, especially in the U.S., you know, where you've got a horrendous program of 36 preschool vaccinations, you know. That's just the beginning. I mean, they have hundreds that are in development and they're planning yeah. to mandate them for the adults as well. You know, and, and uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Steiner philosophy, but, you know, it's over 100 years ago that Rudolf Steiner made the observation and he said eventually a vaccine will be found to literally shut down any possibility of any spiritual awakening. Yeah, that's part of the part of the program for sure. It, it's to shut down the right brain. I mean, you know, we probably don't have time to explore that now, but you know, um, the orthodoxy will have you believe that the brain is a single organ. It's not, by any stretch of the imagination. It, it's it's at least two completely separate organs. They appear mm -hmm. to be mirror images of each other, but they are divided by the the corpus callosum. Right. And the left hemisphere of the brain is the transmitter receiver 
that has very, very limited bandwidth in terms of its uh, transmission and reception capacity. And that's what provides us with the interface with this physical construct in which we believe we function. I think you're referring to what they call the real world, right? Oh, their real world, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the right brain, on the other hand, is not constrained by the constructs of the real world. So the right brain has limitless bandwidth and, uh, and, it, and certainly isn't constrained by the construct of time. And it, obviously there's a lot of research, there's a lot of um, material that is available for people to research or study if they want to explore that. But of course, for most people, it's stepping so far beyond their bounds of perception that they can't even begin to actually comprehend what I've just said. And the establishment know very, very well that if people are able to access the capacity that resides in every single one of us within the right brain, then they're totally off. And so consequently, they are going to do everything and they are doing everything they possibly can to shut down the right brain capability within humanity and keep everybody absolutely locked in to the left brain. And, and this is the role, I mean, because people respond to different things in different ways, but this is why, you know, humanity is under such a phenomenal attack. I and mean, it's bio-spiritual warfare. You know, it's GM foods, it's the vaccines, it's the fluoridation of the water, it's the aerial spraying, it's the bombardment of radio frequencies and, and 5G, Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is a massive part of that. And you know, already we're seeing cities in the UK destroy their tree population, you know, cities that were industrial cities that wow. were actually built with, with, with massive tree lined avenues to sort of yeah. counter the, um, uh, the effects of the industrialization. And they're now having trees it, destroyed it, to make way for 5G. It, re it reminds me exactly similar to... Did you read Tolkien's trilogy, The Lord of the Rings? Oh, I didn't read it, no. When, when Saruman, one of the evil wizards, was building this horrible empire, that one of the first uh, orders that he gave his monsters that he had bred was to rip out all the old trees. And that was in the... U that was, uh, he was from the UK, anyway. Yeah. The author. So, sorry. Well, yeah, that's what's happening. I mean, we've got a, a city not far from where I'm sitting right now, uh, Sheffield. And, um, you know, Sheffield Council signed a contract with a Spanish company to destroy half of their 35,000 trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, been... that's, that's just unimaginable. I mean, yeah. I guess the, the idea is trees are inefficient because they block microwaves or, or millimeter exactly waves. Right. And, and, you know, the facts, again, there's a lot of information out there. You know, it's the trees, and when the trees are in foliage, they are a major block to... Um, right. The Plus, they're feet. the cause of all the disease because of the pollen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, consequently, it can be stopped. And, and you know, the reality is the more outrageous the agenda then the more likely that it is that actually people will start to realize that they're under attack. And you know what? I have to say this, but, you know, it's thank God for the women in the population because the, mm -hmm. the male, it tends to be much more short-term oriented. You know, and, well, and, and you're trained, you're much easier cut off feelings, you know, for whatever reason. Males can do that quicker as a rule. Yeah, and the, and the focus is much more short term, you know, probably in yeah. so terms of keeping the roof over the head for the family and food on the table, you know, etc. So it's it's very much looking at the the um, uh, the hierarchy of, of needs, you know, it's Maslow Herzberg stuff. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the female, particularly the mature female, has a much greater capacity for looking at the bigger picture. And, this is and one of the reasons why they want total gender confusion. Absolutely. Because each one is really suited to make a certain contribution, and if neither one knows which they are, that may not come up. Exactly right. You've, you've got it in one, Richard. I mean, you know, everything that's occurring is absolutely interconnected. And, you know, but the fact that we can see 
the bigger picture is an irrelevance in the wider scheme of things because you know each one of us is is a a single voice mm -hmm. the challenge is to stimulate people's curiosity to see it for themselves because um you cannot tell people i mean that's you know people people will naturally resist being told something especially if it's counter to their prevailing worldview right right and the challenge is to gently nurture people to look at something that they wouldn't perhaps normally look at or look at something in a different way to which they have been looking at it and then come to their own realization and you know we sow the seeds and you know we have to resist being evangelical because that just turns people off anyway so you know we just have to gently sow the seeds Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of those seeds will fall on the proverbial stony ground and, and some may not germinate for months or years later. But I, nonetheless, I, I'm really I'm thinking not, at this point that they all eventually germinate at some well, point. I'd love to think so. So I, th you know, I think it's true. The, the emphasis then is on simply sowing the seeds without any attachment to the outcome. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, it, you know, well, I mean, one of the things that um, I think is absolutely crucial is, is one, not having an attachment to the outcome, but also to visualize our desired outcome and, and do that on a regular basis. You know, just put the vision out there of how we would like to see things unfold. But at the same time, not having an absolute attachment to your vision, right. because if you do you may actually be limiting what is ultimately possible because what is ultimately possible may actually be way beyond the bounds of our capacity to visualize right now i'm sure it usually is and and, and you're getting into a subject that could be you know enough for several more shows in itself yeah. how to do that but i would just add to it that in addition to the picture that you're holding the emotional component that goes with it is critically important absolutely absolutely i mean it's just got to be done well uh, i mean like one can say it's got to be done on the basis of love but i mean it's i think it's got to be done on the basis of what we are looking to try to engender is the best possible outcome for humanity to evolve naturally mm -hmm. and and of course unfortunately what is un what is potentially uh, unfolding at a phenomenal rate of knots is a push towards transhumanism right. uh, and in fact at my conference at the av9 event i mean on the sunday night is going to be the big debate and the, the motion is this house believes that humanity is on the cusp the big question is on the cusp of what do you and want to take you want to take about one to two minutes to tell about that conference specifically well as you said yes i will do but the the debate is to actually discuss whether or not humanity is on the brink of getting a massive upgrade in consciousness or, or mass extinction. Okay. And, and you know, we have uh, speakers coming. In fact, we have a couple of speakers coming in from the US. We have Jay Dyer and um, um, uh, uh, name's gone for me for a second, but uh, uh, two speakers coming in from the US. We have um, a, a, a truly outstanding Bulgarian journalist, uh, Diliana uh, Gaitanjeva, who's going to be exposing the weapon, the Pentagon's bioweapons program um, in uh, the old Soviet countries and, and the likelihood that actually the, the Pentagon and um, Britain's own port and down probably have more to do with the recent um, supposed poisoning of Sergei uh, Skripal in the UK than yeah. the Russians. Well, I, I mean, it's perfect to stage that because that's the reason for uh, building up toward World War Three with Russia. Of course it is, absolutely, which, you know, the West desperately needs because it's bankrupt. Yeah. Well, also because it's a reason that everybody asks to please be saved by world government. Yeah, absolutely. So, AV9, is, it's a conference, it's in the heart of England, it's uh, just about 70 miles north of London. Um, it's a residential event. We have people coming in from the US, from Canada, from Australia. Um, it, we, we bring together some 300 people uh, and, and it embraces people from right across the social, the political, the philosophical, the religious spectrum. You know, they're, they're effectively all united by the observation that something definitely isn't right. And we need to 
actually get involved in bringing about the changes that we all know we need to see. Well, if it can be done with the attitude that you described with that visualization and feeling what it would be like the way that you want it to be instead of fighting just against what's wrong, that could make all the difference. Absolutely. Anyway, well, we're exactly at uh, the time limit here, but I think that was incredible, and you went over a lot of important information in a short time. Hope that we can have a, a future installment if you're up to it at some point. I'm sure we can, Richard. I'm sure we can. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Ian. I really appreciate it. We'll okay. Talk to and, uh, and maybe you could just put the uh, websites um, on the, the link to... I'd the, like uh, to. And let's just... Why don't you just say them one more time for everybody listening? Okay. Well, my own website is uh, ianrcrane.com. That's I-A-N-R-C-R-A-N-E, com. And then the website for the conference is Alternative View. Dot co dot uk perfect okay we'll talk to you soon ian thanks a lot thanks richard you have a good evening okay you too bye all right there goes ian crane ian r crane um exposing what he calls the political webs good term i think uh how all these different conspiracies that we're not supposed to know about fit together how they interact with each other. You should check out both of his sites. His personal site is ianrcrane.com, I-A-N-R-C-R-A-N-E.com, and the site that talks about his upcoming conference that it's going to be held in May called the Alternative View Conference <clears throat> is the site address is alternativeview.co.uk. And that's going to be held in May, and uh, I think you'll find it very interesting to read about. So, we focused a lot on on the great work that Ian is doing on the practice of fracking. And, you know, in, in my opinion, what really struck me, too, is this is something that uh, President Donald Trump in the U.S. really needs to understand and act against. And I think with his attitude, with Trump's attitude on wanting to cut out corruption wherever he sees it, what he's done against lobbying and uh, so many other things, uh, the powers that be know that if he found out about some of these things that are going on that he doesn't understand, apparently, that he'd move against them immediately, and that's why they want him gone or dead or both. Um, <clears throat> he's been great on unleashing us from ridiculous government regulations in the United States and also from the Save the Earth frauds, like was happening with the Paris Climate Conference and TPP agreement, things like that. But it really seems like he doesn't yet understand what the real environmental issues are. And, you know, an environmental is a word like so many others that's kind of been ruined because it's been being used as a scam to get us to give up our remaining freedoms which are not granted by government, they're just recognized by legitimate governments and they come from our source or from God as, as the uh, founding documents of the United States say. But um, people tend to segregate into these labels and groups like conservative and liberal and right and left and things like that and if they just drop the labels just be brave enough to drop the labels and be interested in whatever is true and not care who has claim to, to what issue or what position, things like that. Things could get a lot better. And when you really look at what the environment is, the, the issue of the environment, it's our life support system on this planet that keeps the biosphere alive, which means all the life on the, on the surface of the earth and right above it and uh, damaging that life support system to get to release energy with technologies like fracking and nuclear power and so many other ones that's suicidal it's not brilliant and i think donald trump really understands the uh, using the environment as a fraud to give us get us to give up freedoms but i don't have the feeling that he understands yet and really knows about the real environmental issues and I'm trying to get that information to him through the wall that's been set up of the people around him to keep him from finding that information and they're trying to get rid of him before that happens so you know even with petroleum and coal uh, 
for energy aside from the fracking issue. F fracking is just so ridiculous it should be banned from the planet immediately. The people who have been promoting it should be to the degree they knew about it and were doing it without caring for the consequences, they should be held accountable for that. But even aside from fracking, which destroys groundwater and so many other things with toxic pollution that just gets dumped in the environment, as Ian was explaining, even aside from that, the petroleum and coal as sources for energy, which are plentiful, there's not a shortage of coal and there's not even really a shortage of oil. Michael Rupert wrote that famous book, Crossing the Rubicon, about peak oil, but it wasn't true. And I think he didn't understand that the amount of oil available and probably still being produced in the earth, it's not coming from fossils, it's uh, a different process altogether, that's another issue. But even the fact that they're plentiful, they're still dirty, expensive, unnecessary. They haven't been necessary really ever. And uh, certainly in the last, <clears throat> excuse me, last hundred years or so, you might, if you were interested in this subject, you might want to listen to the shows that we had on Stephen Greer's work in Lost Arts Radio. Uh, well, you can go to either lostartsradio.com or blogtalkradio.com forward slash lostartsradio. Every show that we've had from the beginning is there. And even though we don't get as much viewing on YouTube or the views that we do get, get censored and not shown by YouTube, apparently they like our work. Um, you can find our shows with Stephen Greer really easily. It's S-T-E-P-H-E-N Greer. Or actually, um, now that I say it, I'm not sure. It might be S-T-E-V-E-N. Um, but anyway, Stephen Greer's work, look up, go on YouTube and look up uh, Lost Arts Radio, Stephen Greer, and you'll find both of them. Really interesting. And the problem is that real energy information, real environmental issue, uh, information on technologies that would actually be beneficial for cleaning up the situation in the environment right now, just like real health information, those things are violently suppressed. Um, I'm not just t saying this from hearsay. We've, I've got a friend who recently acquired significant amount of money, and um, he and his partners who had gotten that money together, this was many millions of dollars, they said, okay, now that we don't have to worry about money anymore, you know, kind of like Forrest Gump's famous comment, one less thing to worry about. Um, they said, let's do something beneficial. Let's do an environmental project. <clears throat> and they looked all around and they found something that I think is kind of innocuous, you know, they, but important. They, they were going to take the waste uh, that was being generated from one particular industry and recycle it in a way that was really clean not just sell it to another individual as often done in the recycling scam and then dump it in the ocean or turn it into something else dirty. They were actually going to do something good and they were visited the next day after making this plan by some of the alphabet agency representatives who said, you know about this new idea you've got about this environmental project, uh, you're not going to be doing that project. And they said, well, why, why we want to do this project? And, and they were shown technology that had recorded everything they'd ever said on telephones, faxes, everything else. And the technology was able to twist that and put it together into a confession for any crime that they wanted to uh, accuse these guys of. And they said, you go ahead with this plan, this environmental plan, and we've got your confessions to whatever we want and you'll all spend the rest of your lives in prison. So after careful thought, they decided not to do that project. And this is this is the real environmental policy of the so-called deep state. It's not just a, you know something connected to one or, or both um, political parties that are known. It's behind the scenes and it's very deeply entrenched. St Stephen Greer talks about it a lot. Um, and I thought that case was really interesting because they've got this uh, potential to have any of us confess to anything. That was back when they just had audio, but apparently now they may have video capability where they can actually show us discussing things and, and uh, 
doing just about anything they want to show us doing. They might, might not even need some of the more uh, crude measures that have been being used up to now. And, and this kind of uh, tactic, this kind of mafia tactic has been and is protecting a vast business network that's based on destroying the biosphere for money and fracking is part of it. But there's a lot more that's part of it. Fracking is just one particular part that's visible. There, there's a lot more. The whole Wi-Fi, 5G, um, <clears throat> microwave technologies wave that is sweeping the whole world right now, but is intended to get much more intense. They're not unaware that this destroys life on Earth. They're very aware of it. The people that are their servants on the lower levels are enticed by money, but at the top levels it's not about money at all. The, those top levels create the so-called money and use it as a motivating factor for their um, servants and minions on lower levels that are willing to, to do anything for money as long as they get the uh, prestige and the power and the uh, enjoyment that they want personally, they're willing to just um, damage and kill all life forms on the planet. And uh, the top level ruling group that is the source of um, pretty much almost all the threats that endanger the prospects of survival on the planet, it, it's all coming from the same place. And I said, as I said, it's not about money at that level. It's more of a religious, uh, the name doesn't matter, but you could call it satanic worship of a dark power that's all about suffering and death and destruction. Just like normal people would want to go towards light and happiness and uh, sharing that with everybody. These guys are the opposite. And it's not that they're intrinsically different than us. This is why pride is really not worth it. <laughs> You know, if it, if we weren't if it weren't for good fortune on our side, we would be where they are and doing what they're doing. And if we were looking through their eyes, out of their history and the way their brains are put together, we would be doing precisely what they're doing. So there's no basis on which to con condemn or hate anybody, even the worst of the bad guys. And they want to keep us in this paradigm of fighting and hating and contention and wanting to kill whoever we decide is bad. This keeps us in the same paradigm of fighting and hatred and darkness. And uh, there was an allegory about that in the first of the Star Wars movies, but it's really happening in real life. So because of their confusion and the fact that they're wrapped up in the negative programs of their own minds, one day they'll be free of that, but they're not now. And because they're all wrapped up in those programs, they think that what they want is their ultimate uh, spiritual goal of merging with that dark force and doing it by finishing a ceremonial sacrifice of all life on the planet. I'm telling you something that is pretty significant here. It's not about money. It's not about business. Those are used to accomplish it at the lower levels. And I don't think, having looked at this for decades, that this movement in that direction can really be stopped by regular force, regular level force. I think that would be a mistake. It would just lead to uh, more, more, more war and more conflict and good guys getting corrupted and taking over for the bad guys and being even worse and that sort of thing. I think this time it's about consciousness. And maybe it always was, but I think this time we have a chance to actually absorb that and, and take advantage of it and do it the way it needs to be done. So that's our opportunity. And um, if we want to break free of that whole paradigm, get out of the chains of what some of the Eastern belief systems call karma, which is absolutely real, but it's all enforced not through external entities, but through the programs in your mind. And you don't need to psychoanalyze it or try to figure out clever ways out of it or anything like that if you separate from it in a certain way. You can't get out of it by force anymore. You know, it's kind of like you can't beat the negative powers that are trying to destroy life in the world by force, I don't think, at this point. And you can't um, 
And the reason for that really is the same thing. You can't destroy mind by force. The old yogis tried, and it does not work, even though they got part way and then fell back after that. It just it's not the way to do it. But there is a way to do it. And it's by changing consciousness and getting reconnected with some of the normal abilities that we used to have, and we've gotten out of touch with those. And we don't have to stay in that condition. We can reverse it and, and start getting some of that back. And, and from what I've seen, this is the biggest fear of the ruling, so-called ruling elite. Because if a certain tiny minority of us even become self-aware to the point of getting back some of our normal faculties that we used to have, the whole game is over and we could turn this place into something incredible on our way to even more incredible things. That's possible and you're not supposed to do it. That, I think, out of all the secrets and the taboos that we're not supposed to know about or ever investigate, that would be number one. So, we may not be able to win this one by ordinary fighting, but there are other ways, as Obi-Wan Kenobi said a few times. And they require effort and inner work that in a way is a lot more challenging than fighting physical outer enemies. Because you can do that and still hold on to your own beliefs. If you want to go beyond that, beyond your own programming, that requires some focus and willingness to actually put the effort in and persistence. You have to stay with it, not just do it for a little while. So anyway, if you're interested in any of that, I thought it'd be good for us to do it about now. And that uh, time is passing quickly. It's a very, very valuable time, what we've got here in the t brief time that we're in human bodies on the, on the earth. And we can make use of that. So if you want to talk about that and get into some of the stuff, specifics that I want to share with you about it, uh, if you want to know some details of what we're going to deal with, go to lostartsradio.com forward slash club. L-O-S-T-A-R-T-S radio.com forward slash club. <clears throat> I wrote that page. It's kind of long, and I'm thinking about abbreviating a little bit more, but it does show the idea of what we're after there, what our ulterior motives are, how we're going to do it. And you're personally invited. I'd love to share it with you. So go to lostartsradio.com slash club. See if it is of interest to you. And if so, uh, I'll meet you next Saturday. You'll see the details on that site. Talk to you then. As of January 2018, the Saturday Live Call-In Show is now an interactive video platform called the Planetary Healing Club. The cost is just a $10 minimum monthly donation automatically billed through your PayPal account. Sign up at lostartsradio.com slash club. The Planetary Healing Club is every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You get your link to participate in the show upon signing up as a member. Those shows are also archived as well for club members. Listen to our new shows with guests every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. All Sunday shows with guests have archives freely available on our website at lostartsradio.com. You can also find them at blogtalkradio.com forward slash lostartsradio, as well as our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the letter C forward slash lostartsradio. Mixcloud at mixcloud.com forward slash lost arts radio and finally look us up under the podcast directory on itunes find us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash lost arts radio or on twitter at lost arts radio be sure to join the free lost arts radio facebook group as well just search for lost arts radio group within facebook you can also join our forum on our website if you want to interact with other listeners. We also have links to all of the great independent musicians whose music we feature each week on Lost Arts Radio. When you do your Amazon shopping, please use Amazon Smile program at smile.amazon.com. And when you choose Lost Arts Research Institute in Sedona, Arizona as your charity, 
Amazon will donate half a percent of whatever your order total is to Lost Arts Research Institute to help fund the building of the school and keep our radio show on the air. Please visit lostartsresearchinstitute.org for more information on the school we want to build. Be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter on our site under the Radio Show tab or right from the button on our Facebook page. Contact Richard at richard at lostartsradio.com or myself, Doug Diamond, at doug at lostartsradio.com. Thanks again for listening to Lost Arts Radio, and we'll see you again next week. Smile